Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Justin Cates. I'm the Director of Emergency Management for the City of Nashua, New Hampshire, and also a board member at the National Alliance for Public Safety, GIS, NAPSIG Foundation. I want to welcome you to this vignette as part of our Inspire session on project management, project design, and project development. And with me today is Dr. Rodrigo Nito Gomez. He's a professor and faculty member at the Naval Postgraduate School's Center for Homeland Defense and Security. Thanks for being with us, Rodrigo. Thank you so much, Justin. Nice seeing you. Thank you. Now, Rodrigo and I, we met uh, as part of my program at the Naval Postgraduate School in the master's uh, degree for Ho Homeland Security. And uh, I got to experience a project that uh, was part of our strategy class called Lean Launchpad. And I thought, man, this is a perfect opportunity to, to introduce this to practitioners in Homeland Security and Public Safety as part of the Inspire session. So uh, maybe, Rodrigo, maybe just tell us a little bit about what Lean Launchpad is and what it's typically used for. Of course. So Lean Launchpad is it's a methodology, basically, of uh, how to manage projects and institutions. It's a methodology how to think about strategy in a more experimental way. Right. So if you want to, uh, and, and maybe a way of comparing it, if you think about the traditional waterfall planning mechanism that we follow frequently in government, where you come up with specifications, have a re request for proposals, you design uh, what you want to do, then you, a, a, a lean launch, but uh, kind of flips that one into a cycle of what we call build, measure, and learn cycles. Um, and the, there are some elements of that, but I would say that uh, the most important thing to retain is that it's based on the a scientific method and the idea that you will never know what the customer wants until you start working with them. And it's through that cycle of iterative learning that you develop a better, higher quality of products and services. People will recognize very easily the result of the Lean Launch, but if they're using any software that comes in versions, right? If you think how every time that a software is developed at the beginning, it's one way and then little by little it changes and what, they, what the, the, the product managers are doing, what the CEO of those companies are doing is that they're taking the information and feedback from customers and, and making sure it gets built. So think for example, of a website, uh, if it's a website from the government, it gets delivered Right, and then you might not see a new change in 20 years. Mm -hmm. Amazon is never done. Google is never done. Uh, 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 MS Teams or Zoom are never done. These are products that are constantly using a feedback loop uh, to understand how to improve the product. So that's that's what Lean, Lean, Lean Launch, but it's a, it's a it's a way to manage strategy that is all based on the capacity of organizations uh, to learn from uh, interactions with customers with people they serve uh, and make sure that they can get better that way. Perfect. And one, you know, one of the big components of the Lean Launchpad is Alexander Osterwalder business model canvas. And maybe can I tell us a little bit what does that consist of and how is that used as part of the Lean Launchpad process? Sure. So, so the Lean Launchpad is one of those concepts that have become part of a slang among a certain community of practice. Mm -hmm. uh, it's based on three core pillars, if you will. So one is, is uh, as you mentioned, the business canvas. The other one is the customer development process. And the third one would be uh, agile manufacturing right? that, mm -hmm. that was pioneered in the automobile sector. And I mentioned that one because a lot of the examples that we might have for lean come from software. And nevertheless, it actually was pioneered. Uh, agile was pioneered in hardware manufacturing, specifically, specifically automobile. So it, just to make that... That, that, that connection. So the, the, the business canvas, right? It's a, it's a very common uh, tool used by innovators. It's kind of the standardized way of designing your experiments. And it is, it is a method, right? If you think of methodology, right? Any, any, of, any of you who are listening to us who has a scientific background, right? Most, most, uh, most uh, uh, scientific disciplines come up with their own methods of, to approach things. So the canvas is one of them. Now, being this for innovators and the, the, the culture of Silicon Valley, they like to make sim things simple. So instead of cal calling it a methodology, they made a cute, nice chart uh, that it's uh, intellectually easier to process because our brains like images and contextualize things. But it's basically a methodology of approaching problems. The same way, if you could put names, which probably you could, if you could put names on a graphic way, right? And you would call it the names canvas. Well, the business development canvas is that, right? It's a, it's, it's a method that has been made graphic. 
and it 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 it's formed by multiple little boxes. Each of those boxes are basically a series of hypotheses. Uh, we can talk more about some of them uh, that you will go and test as you are deploying your product or service. And this is why it's so common for uh, uh, startups to start doing one thing and then pivot, right? And we'll talk about that more, but change direction. This is because they have learned that one of those boxes in the canvas was not what they thought it was. They learned it through experiments and through those experiments, they now have better information to change their shape of their businesses or practices or services to something that looks more like what the customers actually expect from them. So that's what the canvas is. It's a blueprint that will give you a heuristic, right? A way of thinking about things, uh, of how to run your experiments and get better at uh, creating products or services people actually want to use. One of the things that's interesting about the, the canvas that, that I think I had to kind of learn as I went through the course was it's really not meant to be sort of one canvas. You, you kind of are changing it over time. Uh, and, and what the kind of the final canvas looks like is, is very likely not to be what the original canvas, those hypotheses that you had mentioned. Maybe talk a little bit about that concept of, of developing the hypothesis as to what product or service that you really want to develop. For any of us in government that has many years of strategic planning practices, for example, this is one of the most unnerving parts of the process. If you think about how we build plans and strategic plans in government and, and in big uh, private sector corporations too, uh, the traditional way has been that you go together, maybe you go to a nice retreat with a facilitator or you hire one of these big uh, consulting firms or whatever process your agency uses up according to budget. And you might come with mission, visions, objectives, uh, goals, et cetera. And then you put them all together on a single document. And this document becomes the strategic plan 2030 or 2040, whatever time horizon you are managing. And it's in this glossy, it used to be at least this glossy paper. Now it's a PDF, but uh, we, 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 we gotten cheap. Uh, but uh, you have like this important document and it's sent to all stakeholders and you put it in your uh, uh, in your bookshelf and every time that a new project comes you have to kind of justify so that's the old way of doing it it's a very permanent document right in fact this is why Minsberg calls strategic planning an oxymoron right you cannot be strategic and fixed on a plan at the same time now in lean management and specifically in in in, in with the lean launchpad what you're doing is the opposite and you're saying okay the first, the first canvas often is built like that, like what I described, uh, the, the, the core team of a startup, the leadership team of a police department, uh, the director of emergency management and the people mostly close to the strategic uh, capable of that area will come, and uh, come up with their hypothesis. But the difference is that you will put those not on a glossy paper and a strong format. No, you'll, you'll write them in sticky notes, right, mm -hmm. on the canvas. The sticky note is a powerful component of this because of its psychological association to temporality, right? Mm -hmm. So now uh, there's a lot of softwares that you can do it, but when I run this one, if you remember, I actually recommend doing it on paper. Yep. I'm a very digital person, but this is the one place that I actually recommend people doing it the analog way because putting things on sticky notes comes with a very strong association with temporality. Mm -hmm. So we're going to put this here uh, and then you're going to test it. And we're going to come back and say, you know what? We thought people wanted these from emergency management, uh, 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 damage assessments, and in, we got it wrong completely, right? What they want instead is this other thing, right? Mm -hmm. So you take that sticky note, you throw it to the trash, and you, you write a new one, and then you go and test it. And, and, and this is a very uh, Karl Popper thing that you're coming with what you would call falsifiable hypothesis. You think people want this, but here is the, the, where, where, where the rubber meets the road. Then you're going to come with an experiment to see if you're right or you are wrong. Right? Mm -hmm. So it has to be very uh, oriented to this idea of falsifiability, right? Uh, so, so it's important for you to demonstrate that this hypothesis can be wrong and that you're going to run an experiment in order to see if it's right or not. Uh, this is what people don't understand about startups. Startups are not about making money. Startups are about running experiments to find the right business model, right? And that's mm -hmm. why they change so many times direction until, until they get it right. 
so kind of expanding on that, and you had mentioned a little bit earlier about how agile is a, is a major component of the Lean Launchpad process. And you also had talked about waterfall, which is, I think, traditionally how we think of projects within public sector. You know, it's like, here's what the end looks like, and we're going to design it to, to meet that. Why is it so essential to have that iterative process in Lean Launchpad and, and think about, you know, how you're going to constantly revise and, and kind of redesign whatever you're putting, putting together? Because you're going to get it wrong. In, in a nutshell, you could give it a, think of all, how many programs in government, right? I, I, won't, I won't give examples, but think how many programs in government come based on the hypothesis that this is what people want and then you deploy and it's too late and you discover that we don't want that. How many interfaces, for example, talk about software? Uh, well, uh, you cannot do what you want it. So you actually kind of have to hack it around and you tell people, okay, in the comment section, you have to enter these. There's no section for that. And then you have to train hours. So every so in software, every hour of training is it's a failure of the interface, right? It means that the inter nobody trained you to use Amazon, nobody trained you to use Expedia, right? Nobody, uh, those those are interfaces that are so intuitive, but they weren't like that. They became intuitive after hundreds, maybe hundreds of thousands of iterations to get mm -hmm. stuff right. So the reason why you want to go through the build, measure, learn cycle and make sure that your strategy is based on that because that's how we, 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 we operationalize the idea of a learning organization, right? So mm -hmm. what Lean gives you from a government perspective, it's a business process. And yes, governments can have business processes too. It's a business process that it's oriented to constantly learning how your customer, in this case, the citizen wants to interact with you. So that's why it's so important. It's very dangerous for even the smartest people to get into a room, uh, come up with specifications, deploy them in the field, and then have no capacity to constantly adapt to what they... And then even if you get it right at one point, if you get, you get lucky, the environment changes, right? So sure. Kodak was a very successful product until it wasn't. Blockbuster was a great idea until it wasn't, right? And uh, if you fail to learn from the changes in the environment, even the projects that used to be right, might be wrong now. So this is the other reason why you want to make sure that as you build your strategies, you build strategies that are learning strategies. And so far, uh, be, call it build, measure, learn, call it agile, call it the OODA loop for anybody from, from, from the services, right? Mm -hmm. Don't every end, decide and act. All of these are uh, heuristics, models, logics built on the idea that you will always be better constantly uh, sending probes, learning from what those probes inform you uh, uh, and then changing your approach to whatever practices you have based on that. So, I think it's an important piece of this is, is that iterative approach. And that's something I think what we hope in, in this session is we convince people that this is something they should look into certainly much more often. Yeah, so kind of, yeah. Uh, yeah, it's so, so sorry, but uh, the, the, the flip of the coin of, of Amazon is never done, which is true, is what the LinkedIn founder said. If you release your version 1.0, if you're not ashamed of your version 1.0, you release too late, right? Mm -hmm. So because the version 1.0 are meant for you to learn. And, and this is why well, I know we, 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 we might be talking a little bit more about it. this, why the idea of the MVP, right? So the mm -hmm. minimum viable product is so important. You're using your development cycle to learn. This is very different to using your development cycle to create finished products. Mm -hmm. That's not what you're trying to do when you're working on, on Lean. No, that makes sense. Absolutely. So uh, the kind of the other component of this that we haven't talked about yet is, is the customer development process. And it seems like that's a really big part of the approach, or at least one area that uh, Steve Blank, who you know, kind of, promotes this Lean Launchpad process, really emphasizes in, in his trainings. Um, he pushes this idea, get out of the building all the time. Like it's just like this catchphrase that he has. Uh, why is it so important to actually get out of the building and talk to people who are gonna use your product or service? Because there's no truth in your inside of the building, right? There is no truth inside of your office. It goes to what we were saying. You, you might have the, most, the smartest means, right? Subject matter experts. And you have might put them in a room and you think you got it right. And then you get out and you fail miserably, right? Mm -hmm. Now, in the private sector, uh, that means that you'll execute your uh, business plan all the way to bankruptcy, 
right? Which is what mm -hmm. happens often when you are uh, uh, impermeable to, to the changes in the environment. In government, it's a little more, it's trickier because you don't go bankrupt. And this is why so many bad projects can linger in the system and keep, keep sucking resources, even though nobody wants them, right? Think how many of their websites in government are, are basically a wasteland, right? Mm -hmm. so, so that nobody visits, right? So, and they look like a GeoCities website because nobody has updated it in 20 years. Um, probably that's when they were coded. So when you get out of the building, you get that feedback back. Think for example, uh, how much waste, right? The, the app that people use, how much waste is uh, a, a, a public works uh, interface that is designed to tell you where there are potholes when stuff is that, that feedback, right? So gives you data as a driver, but potentially as a city, if you are connected to their data feed uh, to react better than, uh, than without data. So ultimately there is no truth inside of the building uh, getting out of the building, by the way, doesn't mean necessarily needs to. In the COVID years, doesn't need to be necessarily <laughs> the building. There are digital ways in which you can uh, get feedback from your user. The other thing is that it's very important to understand that surveys are not feedback from customers. Mm -hmm. In government, we do like polling to uh, poll, polling uh, or customers poll for many reasons, and surveys are a really bad way of gathering data. Yeah. I'll explain it this way: compare your next Netflix queue. Uh, uh, all, 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 all of these artsy movies that you say you want to watch to your Netflix history, all of those superhero movies that you actually watched, right? So the cue is what you would answer in a poll about what you want to watch. The, the history is who you actually are. So you reveal your behavior uh, much better when you are actually acting in the real world than when you are responding to a survey. And that's why you want to be looking at your users uh, in the way they interact with you and not just polling them. Um, and, and any project that doesn't build into the ramping a, a constant feedback and it allows for change based on that feedback uh, will tend to end up producing subpar quality products or services. Well, that's, a good, that's actually a really good example there. And I, I think that's, that is a problem that we have in in the public sector is, you know, so often it's just throw out a survey and we'll get some feedback and it, and it doesn't really give us the, the results that we should be getting. Um, and, and it's definitely a, a concern of ours. Yeah, surveys, surveys and pilot programs are the uh, opium of the government projects, right? So they give us a sense of uh, us having some kind of external feedback and for different reasons, both mm -hmm. surveys and pilots tend to actually fail at what the uh, build measure cycle actually succeeds, which is to get constant feedback and then uh, change direction based on that feedback. Mm -hmm. So kind of expanding on that one, um, one, one interesting part of this process, at least as, as I went through the, the program, was understanding that in some cases, what you're designing may no longer be necessary or at least in the original format that you had anticipated. So they, they promote this concept of pivoting. Um, and, and this is something I think we do see a challenge within the public sector because we're, we're so invested in whatever we put together that we can't make a, a major shift in a different direction or, or maybe even say, you know, cancel the project. It's, it's no longer a necessary piece. How do we better understand um, our, our customers pains and gains, why they actually want to use the service and create something that's actually going to be useful to them. Yeah, this is one of the scariest things about Lean is that you, you start building something and you end up building something completely different. In government, we're often afraid of procurement practices that might make it hard for us to deviate too much from the specifications. Now, there are ways of doing it. This is not the subject of this conversation, but a good procurement officer actually knows now how to work around a government's do have the ability to go lean and there's agile uh, vehicles uh, they, they, so 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 don't let your uh, don't let don't let that be the uh, deal breaker of a lean project with that said yes you start doing something and there is always this kind of fear that what you thought was the greatest idea ever that you invest time right and you invest and you, you invest career uh, reputation uh, might not be what the customer wants. And at one point you might have to go in a different direction. Uh, this is what, what we often call in innovation literature, the P 
pivot or persevere question. Right? Do I mm -hmm. keep going down the same route or not? And it's very important organizationally that whoever has a decision-making authority and, and empowers a, a, a project managers to give them the top cover for them to be the first people to come to the boss and say, hey, what I thought we were doing, it needs to change because I have great feedback in, 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 from the customer development process, from, from the build measure that it's, I thought that people were going to be reporting crimes online this way. And what they actually want to be doing is reporting public works problems, right? All of the messages that I'm getting are from there. So um, and this is a completely made up example. So uh, this implies, for example, that it's not anymore the law enforcement agencies that would be engaged, but actually maybe public works or the city sure. management or and you suddenly have to completely change internally the stakeholder of your project. So you need some mechanism with it, the way you are building it. So not only you can change the product, but the customer, right? The, cost, the, the, the customer is one of the things that can change, right? I thought this was going to be an enterprise project. And it's in, fa in fact, it's the opposite. It's for the public. Or I thought that it was going to be citizens of my district who were going to be uh, benefiting from it. And instead, it's everybody in the state, whatever, right? And, and this flexibility means that you might not end up exactly where you want it to go, but you end up in a place that it's better. And yeah. the first thing that I would say to answer that question that you, that you mentioned, Justin, is that we need necessarily uh, organizations that are innovation friendly. And this is not uh, uh, fluff, right? This means, for example, things as practical, as I said, encouraging project managers that their careers will not be over if suddenly the project they invested time changes stakeholder or change of shape that actually you reward the capacity to pivot and find customers there where they are instead of trying to force it uh, to be something that it shouldn't be because you have enough information at that point that the project is not working the way you thought it would be. So one of the things that I think was was really a big piece of, of the strategy course that I took through an MPS was about the testing piece of this, because this is where you go out and actually start to understand the pains and gains of those of those customers. And then you're getting better information about how you might pivot in a different direction. Maybe tell me a little bit about some of these, these tests. What, what are the different types of tests that are out there? And, and how, does a, how does somebody who's, who's going through a process to develop a service or a product um, actually implement these tests out in the field? Correct. Yeah, thank you. That's a great question. And, and I mentioned it is one of the parts that I think often fails, even when you look at the uh, uh, statement of work of a project in government, there is very little information about how the hypothesis of the project actually will be tested. Uh, so how do I go and learn? Uh, how do I go and learn that the thing that I wanted to build is actually the thing we should be building, right? So, uh, and this goes to the idea of iteration. The mm -hmm. first reason why we do all this uh, as risk managers, right? As emerging managers, the, we will understand this is de-risking a project, mm -hmm. right? One of the things that are scary about the idea of pivoting is that if you already invested $20 million in a project, you don't want to pivot, right? You, you're, yeah. you're all in, right? So you burn, So what you want to do is build cheap ways to fail fast, right? The so-called fail fast. Uh, so you can learn early on what are some of the problems. So some of these experiments might literally be things as simple as building stuff with styrofoam and card box, right? Uh, mm -hmm. I, I cannot tell you the amount of experiments we've run both here at NPS and in other places where you, you, you make it with styrofoam and put it inside of a law enforcement car and say, holy crap, this whole thing is blocking now my view, right? You didn't think about it? No, we didn't, right? There's, there's this anecdote from DARPA of a big system that was about to be deployed. It was going to be a multi-million project and nobody had thought that by doing it that way, it completely changed the tactical approach of how we man manage uh, tank battalions. And it wasn't on the, they literally made it inside of a computer in this case, right? They render it uh, and they simulated it inside of the computer. So very, uh, a very small cost compared to the cost of the project that they find, found out, holy crap, if we do it like this, uh, uh, we are just screwing completely the core advantages that we have when engaging with the adversary. So mm -hmm. experiments are, some of them very basic. Uh, I like for process-based uh, innovation. And remember, governments also put products out. A policy is a product. Uh, the mm -hmm. most important product that Henry Ford put out, it was not the Model T. It was the production line. The production mm -hmm. line is a process. 
right? So uh, when you want to build a process, one of my favorite ways of running experiments are actually reenactments. So you mm -hmm. select a core moment of that process and you just ask either actors, professional actors when possible, but if not just uh, friends, family, whatever has to be, and try to reenact it. Is it clear or not? Do people understand what you're wanting from them? Is there a PDF form involved? Can you print, for example, three or four different versions of the PDF? That's called A-B testing, right? I'll show you three forms, which one is clearer. Am I collecting data I don't need to, right? There is a there is information gloat in, in government. Some, some of our forms collect 10 times the same thing in different points, right? So can I identify those pain points when I ask for the social security number five times to the same person, right? You shouldn't be asking more than once the same data point. And ideally you shouldn't be asking at all if you can avoid it, right? Sure. Make it as simple as this is the issue of removal of friction. All of these are experiments that will tell you a lot more than a survey. Right. Mm -hmm. I can show you two PDFs and tell you which one you like better. And even, even if you tell me neither, right, all of them suck, then I'll ask you why. And you'll yeah. have data based on if I tell you, okay, tell me the most important things for a survey form. For, what do I know? I don't work for FEMA. I don't work from this. I, I don't know. Or I'll tell you whatever I think. Right. So by presenting you uh, two examples, even if none of those two are good, I'm already forcing you into thinking about some of the things that have to change. And there's a long catalog of, of, of experiments like that, uh, both for products uh, and processes. And depending on the level of, of maturity of your project, uh, you, you, you'll you use different different kinds of experiments. Perfect. No, I think, and that was that was a really important part of the, of the course. And that was something I think really resonated with me is, is having the opportunity to actually build an experiment and actually go through the process to see, okay, is this going to work or is, is it not? And having also some diversity in the different experiments, I think was also helpful for me because it, each one of them gave me a different perspective on some of the changes I need to make with, with the process. Yeah. This is the issue of sequencing that we actually discuss, right? Uh, in, in a class of strategy, uh, somebody told me the other day that our class feels like a Montessori school. Uh, because uh, we are the Montessori School of Graduate Education because everything is about interacting, right? Whereas in the traditional strategic planning class, you might spend the whole time of the class just coming up with the principles of planning and then putting a blueprint of strategic plan. We kind of reverse that one. And the first thing that we ask is what do you want to do and how, you, how do you prove that you're right? And then now go and test, right? So, so there's a lot of hands-on uh, uh, approach in, in, in this and, and building the sequence of experiments is as important as the type of experiments. Mm -hmm. I, what do I need to learn first? Depending on that result, what do I need to learn second? And then depending on that result, what do I need to learn third? And think of that each of these experiments might pivot you in a different right direction. So you might need to learn different things after that. So we work, if you remember, a lot on the issue of sequencing, which is, okay, which experiments should go in which order. And it's very probable that based on the result of experiment number three, experiments four and five change completely. Yeah. And, and in order to start these experiments, one of the things that I learned you have to have is uh, a minimum viable product, an MVP. And this was a new term for me as well, but I think it's a very important term in this process. When, when do I have the MVP? At what point is... What I put together, something that actually can be experimented with, and at what point is it? It's not ready yet. The earliest you can deploy to learn something meaningful, it goes to what we are discussing. An MVP is designed not to be the final product, uh, but designed so you can learn from what you have already to keep developing the product. So, so the MVP will inform you of what comes next in your strategy. In good lean you actually cannot move next after the MVP, before you deploy the MVP, right? So um, there are many examples that I use. One that I like, if you've ever been in the uh, restaurant industry or have family members, you do often a, what's called a soft opening, right? You can do it with hotels too. And soft openings are literally, you have the furniture, you hire the chef, you have the, the, the waitress and waiters, you gave them the training you invite your friends and family, right? And you invite your neighbors and you treat them like customers and you actually ask them to play a role, right? So you might say, okay, you're going to be the nagging customer and you're going to be the one with gluten intolerance or you're going to be the one with uh, 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 crying kids and whatever, right? And, and I want you to break this, right? Saturate it to the point of, I want to see where it fails because I want to fail 
in a place that it's safe. Remember, yes. we talk about the risking. So your MVP should be a place where you can go and safe. And this has to do with the technology adoption cycle. The early adopters, in this case, your friends, tend to be way more forgiving of mistakes than whoever comes next. And you want to use them uh, to learn. So your MVP is a minimum unit of whatever you want to build later mm -hmm. that teaches you that teaches you what you need to know to go to the next step. Right. Yeah. So the, the example, there's a chart, we can share it in uh, the comments for, for this one. If there's a very famous chart that has uh, an MVP going from a skateboard uh, all the way to an automobile, right? Mm. And how you use a skateboard to learn if people like four wheel vehicles, and mm -hmm. then you might build one with a small engine or you might build an ATV or whatever. And until you get to the, to, that's the metaphor that you're looking for. If you're building a website, for example, thinking of examples in government, when healthcare.gov deployed and uh, had that meltdown that we all remember during the Affordable mm -hmm. Care Out rollout, one of the big mistakes that was identified later on was that they, uh, they opened the website when it was ready for enrollment. That, mm -hmm. that website should have been opened six months before so people could play with it and see what it's going to be like and see what's inside and go and break it and fight bugs at a time that people could not yet... Uh, uh, register for 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 a a, a, a ACA plan. Um, mm -hmm. The same goes with COVID right now. Think of how much we struggled to uh, now register people. How much of our, our, our initial fights after after the the, invent, the the deployment of the vaccines was to find the right way of doing triage and that should have been happening in July next year. Let people kind of register and do it three times if you need to change it. Uh, uh, that's an MVP, right? An MVP is when you deploy a website for vaccination even before you have the vaccine because mm -hmm. you're trying to learn early on what the customer is going to be needing and how the needs are going to look like once you actually deploy the full plan. That's a really great example with the vaccine registration. I, I, I've seen it in so many states where it's been a, a real struggle uh, to 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 really have something that works. Uh, and, and it's unfortunately the first time that many are seeing it is as they're trying to get, you know, thousands and thousands of people to sign up on it. And, and it is true that we didn't know what kind of vaccines we were going to be getting, what kind of refrigerator chain of coal they were going to need, but we knew that we were going to get a vaccine eventually. And we didn't know when, right? So, but, but we need, and you knew that you were going to be performing some kind of triage, that some people were going to be getting it first than others. So there was no reason for us to not start experimenting with a national website or with state managed websites, whatever we would have decided, and, and or maybe a single platform where that it's managed by the states, but it's uh, standardized in the way when you go to Amazon Marketplace, you actually are buying from multiple vendors. You just don't know it because the interface looks standard, right? So it mm -hmm. could have been something like that. And then you could play with it and see if people are getting it. And at that point, for example, the digital gap doesn't matter because there's no vaccine, right? So we are very afraid that uh, older folks that ha have maybe less computer literacy would be getting it less. So this is a place you actually can learn about channels. Channels is one of the elements of the canvas, if you remember. So what are the ways I, I can get to different people? And you would have gotten the better information. You would know where the older folks are, how many people are willing to get the vaccine and volunteering to get the vaccine. So you would have had more information early on because you pivoted three or four times instead of trying to deploy right at the same time, both vaccination, registration, and everything in a, in a single move. Yeah, no, that's that's a great point. That's absolutely great point. Now let's step back from from the lean launch pad and talk more generally about um, you know where a process like this would fit within an organization because I think that was another big piece of of this as I learned through the strategy course was there are different models as to how you can uh, leverage this sort of innovative approach within a maybe a very bureaucratic style organization that we would commonly see in. Homeland Security, public safety, and government. Um, where does this startup style process fit best within uh, an organization? You know, should they have like an incubator within their organization, or or can it be applied to the whole the whole agency? It, it, that's already a good question. It depends on the leadership style, right? So many many organizations have advanced labs, right? So DARPA being one for the Department of Defense, uh, 
uh, uh, Google X for Google. On the other hand, organizations like Apple don't, and they specifically say they don't because they want everybody in the organization feel like they are part of an advanced lab, right? So there is mm -hmm. no easy answer here. It depends on uh, missions and leadership style. I would say Lean works really well whenever there is uncertainty in the shape of the product, right? Lean is designed to explore for the creation of sustainable business plans. Mm -hmm. If you have a business plan that is well known, you probably don't need to use lean, right? This is, for example, the example of franchises in the private sector. You know what you're doing, right? The franchise is, uh, 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 you're trying to make this fast food chain food to, to look exactly like anybody else, to taste the same. You want the same experience in Buenos Aires, in Calcutta, or in uh, Washington DC, right? So in that case, uh, that, that in general, uh, you can go waterfall. Even in those cases though, uh, customer preferences might change. You still want to keep an innovation flow, at least at the strategic level, not at the franchise, but at the strategic level. So this is, for example, every time that we deploy a mission in government that we already know how to run, and it's the same. So hurricane season for there's those places with hurricanes. Uh, we're responding to a fire that it's not beyond the scope of what we know how to respond to fires. Uh, in those cases, SOPs work fantastically. You don't need to be very creative, at least not at that moment. Anywhere where there is uncertainty, which is to say almost any project management where you're doing something new that you've never done before or you're changing, in those cases, uh, some kind of build, measure, learn cycle baked into the system uh, tends to provide better results. So mm -hmm. I would say question yourself as a project manager, as a, a government official. Uh, what I'm doing here is something that we've always done and is just executing with high quality. Or am I entering an element of uncertainty here where we don't know exactly, I think what the customer wants, but I'm not completely sure. Uh, in that case, Lean would be would be a, probably a better approach to deal with. Now, um, one other piece of this, uh, when we try and apply it in, in government or, or you know, public safety, homeland security sectors, um, a lot of times they'll look at the business model canvas and they'll see some terms that maybe seem more toward, more oriented towards the private sector and one of the things that, that Steve Blank, who's promoted the Lean Launchpad process, has talked about is this concept of the mission model canvas. Maybe tell me a little bit about what are some of the differences there and why might a, a government agency look at that approach versus business model canvas? Yeah, so the, it, it's, it's Peter Newell who actually came up with the mission model canvas working with Steve Blank. Peter Newell is a, a, formal, a former uh, a, a leader of the Rapid Equipment Task Force of the Army that actually became very famous by applying lean management practices in, in, in Afghanistan and Iraq to, to solve problems much faster and much more effectively by experimenting directly in the field. So mm -hmm. um, I just mentioned that because for those who say that a, a agencies that put lives at risk cannot be lean, it's kind of the opposite. Right? Mm. It's those who have to be careful and intelligent how to do it. Remember, Lean is all about de-risking. You want to learn in a way that you do it intelligently. So the Mission Model Canvas changes some of the vocabulary. I'm a little critical of it just because I feel that it's potato potato, right? But it's, it is. So for example, instead of customers, we would call beneficiaries the people. Whatever, mm. right? I know that some people like or are rubbed the wrong way by the whole idea of a customer-centric government, right? Uh, so if, if it works better for you, value proposition, which is something that we use in government, uh, uh, get, get, gets changed to programs, etc. So uh, uh, you, you, we might be able to put a, a, a compare and contrast, but in general, I would say you're talking about the same things. You're mm -hmm. just trying to remove the for-profit the for profit, uh, idea of some of these like revenue stream uh, uh, shifts to shifts to uh, 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 program goals, right? So, so these these kind of things, uh, I I normally operate with the traditional one. I'm perfectly comfortable talking about uh, 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 FEMA having a value proposition, right? So I think it does. Uh, but for folks that might be uh, that might be a bridge too far to use vocabulary that comes from the for-profit business sector, the mission model canvas kind of translates it into NGO slash government vocabulary. Uh, uh, for example, instead of channels, we have deployments, right? Mm -hmm. What are your way of deploying a program? Well, it's a channel, right? So you're doing it by email, you're doing it by phone, face to face. Uh, but that that's it. So so as 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 the the people listening to this to this uh, 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 conversation look at the canvas. If if some of the terms that are more associated 
to private sector practices. If they're robbing you the wrong way, just Google uh, uh, Mission Model Canvas, uh, or, or we might provide it in, in, in show notes, in footnotes. And, and that, that one is really oriented to the kind of stuff that we do in governments or in the non-for-profit sector. Yeah, it's a good perspective because I, I had noticed that as well, that a lot of the terms, while you know they were shifted to be a little a bit more, more friendly in government, it really was the same thing. It was the same concept, the same approach was being really used in that. So yeah, so it is true, for example, that you don't have a revenue stream in the sense that you are not looking for profits, but you want to change things, right? So we don't we don't want to make money deploying vaccines, but we still have a baseline, right? We still know sure. that we want everybody to get the vaccine, right? So you can measure in that case how many people, how many shots in, in the arm you're getting, which we're doing, right? So it goes more to the vocabulary, but I do understand that for some folks, the idea of calling uh, the people we serve customers, it's uncomfortable. So we came sure. up, one of the, in this case, Pete Newell came up with a different uh, perspective, right? So um, I think to kind of close this out, um, one of the you know the, one of the big pieces of these vignettes is to provide additional resources. So some of the things that Rodrigo has mentioned so far will be included in the the resources for this specific video. Uh, but Rodrigo, has, what what do you think is really kind of the first steps for um, for an organization looking to adopt uh, the Lean Launchpad concepts? And what resources would you recommend they start with? Yeah, so there's a great MOOC, Massive Online uh, class by Steve Blank that I would recommend anybody. Do. I don't know if you're already sharing it or not, but it's 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 really good. It's on I, I remember one of the platforms uh, available. It's 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 a few videos, very well organized. Uh, so I would certainly recommend uh, recommend looking at it internally. I would say this has to do with with the way we measure performance, right? So organizations that want to go lean should change the way. They measure, they measure performance of the of the uh, of the people working for them because you want to encourage uh, people to experiment uh, mm -hmm. to experiment intelligently to the that that means you don't want people wasting money but there is some element of experimentation that means doing things that in ways you've never done before so internally it would be a, a way of evaluating and reevaluating the way we set objectives and, 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 and performance reviews, right? So that's, that's, that's something that can be done by leadership, right? For example, organizations that reward experimentation that say, I'm gonna see with a positive eye that you try something new, even if it failed. So uh, reward success, reward fa failure, punish inaction, right? So mm -hmm. yeah, I, I, I actually wanna be critical of those who keep doing the same thing as it's been done for the last 20 years. That doesn't mean that we have to change, but I want, at least I want you systematically questioning why do we do the way we do the way we do it. Mm -hmm. uh, and it might be that it's because still the best way of doing it. That's fine. But you want to make sure that that's a deliberate effort. That if you decided to keep doing what you've been doing, it's because you compared it to alternatives and you came sure. back to the same conclusion. It's fine. I mean, we, we do things well in government. Um, there's a book that I probably you have already recommended uh, to, your, uh, to your crowd, but if not, uh, testing business ideas. A lot of what is here can be adapted to the government very easily. Uh, this is a very hands-on approach of the kind of experiments that we can run to test programs. So what I recommend to somebody wanting to run a program in Lean, you come up with your first canvas and literally you say, okay, what are the things you need to validate and mm -hmm. select four or five experiments from this book or any other, but this book it makes a, a nice catalog of, in, so it's a good way to start Later on, you might feel that you can fly with your own wings and, and come up with your own experiments. Uh, but at the very beginning, seeing what has worked for other organizations might be a great way of doing it. And I'm actually going to recommend you two other, two other sources. One is a podcast uh, that it's called The Impact. Uh, so it's a great podcast of how policies influence people and how a, a data that we get from some of those deployments uh, it might show counterintuitive consequences of even well-intentioned policies. So mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a great way of learning about that one. And the third one would be a book that actually is not called or doesn't call itself Lean, but I think it's, it's the best example I've ever seen with Poor Economics by uh, uh, Esther Duflo and Bang Jai. Uh, and, and that book is fantastic. They, they just won the Nobel Prize of Economics like one year or two years ago. Uh, and what they do is they do a lot of evidence-based 
evidence-based uh, uh, policy for development and questioning of, uh, how can we make sure that the stuff that we are doing is actually working. Right? Mm -hmm. so it's really well done there. She has, by the way, a great TED talk that I can share too. I just thought about it. Oh, yeah, it's a good point. Yeah. Uh, so she has a great TED talk where she talks about them all, but the book is worth reading because she doesn't go to the details in the TED talk. So, so those are a few resources that I would say anybody curious to start learning about, about this stuff uh, can go there and, and, and see if, if they work. And by all means, uh, if you can make my, my information available, I am always happy uh, to uh, reach and, 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 and help whoever is interested in, in learning more about this topic. Absolutely. Yeah, we'll definitely share your, uh, your contact info. And um, I think this was a great overview, you know, because it, it, you know, only, we only spent about an hour talking about these topics. There's, you know, so many more hours you can spend uh, learning about each of these individual facets. And then I think you'll also see in some of the other videos that are part of this session about, you know, human-centered design, design thinking, project management. I mean, there's so many different things that all kind of interrel interrelate and connect on this topic. So it's definitely something that public safety, emergency management, homeland security should be looking more into. And um, hopefully they'll take the, the opportunity to look at some of these resources and try and find ways to implement them within their organization. I think so. Uh, and I think they are. I think that we see more and more uh, innovation and creativity in government. This, this trope of the government cannot innovate. Uh, I, 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 there's not a single day that I don't find evidence on the contrary. And I think that out there, state, local, mostly state and local and tribal, more than federal, but state, local, uh, and even federal fighting, fighting uh, uh, bigger enemies. Uh, um, we, we see an incredible dynamic uh, uh, public service uh, trying to uh, create uh, fantastic services and products for the cities. Absolutely. Well, thank you again, Rodrigo, uh, for taking some time to, to you know, provide some insight on some of these topics. And uh, hopefully everybody that's uh, participating in Inspire takes a look at some of the other videos that we have uh, that'll be available for everybody to, to look at. Uh, thanks again, Rodrigo. Thank you so much, Justin.